Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Jeffrey Epstein Show. I'm your host, Bobby Capucci, and this is Daily Drop number 101. We have two articles we're going to get into tonight, folks. And the first article has to do with the defamation case between Ghislaine Maxwell and Virginia Roberts and the ruling made by the judge overseeing that case, Loretta Preska. And the second article we're going to read is about our good buddy, Nicholas Tartaglioni, and how his lawyer is now demanding that there is a hearing and a, an investigation into the uh, missing footage. He wants to have a hearing and he wants to know why that footage went missing. Can't blame the guy, right? Well, we're going to get into both of those articles tonight. We're going to read about both of those and we're going to see what motivated Judge Preska into making her decision, and we're going to see what the lawyer over here in our, our good buddy Nicholas Tartaglioni's case has to say. And, you know, it's kind of, uh, kind of sucks that Preska decided to not release the documents, but as you'll see in the article, I'm sure, she's, they're, they're going to go into why she decided not to unseal those documents, and also she talks about what could happen with those documents in the future. So let's read that article first. We'll jump into that one first because I think that one's a little bit more important, right? We've been waiting for this ruling and I thought it was going to be on the 16th, but I, you know, guess not. Today's the 13th and that's when the ruling came down. So let's hop into this article. This article is from lawandcrime.com. The author is Jerry Lamb and it was uh, published January 13th, 2020 at 4.04 p.m. Make sure you hit the article too, folks. It's always a good idea to, you know, check out what they have going on, pictures and all of that stuff as well. And there's always helpful hyperlinks so you can follow, you know, different things that were going on previously in the case. So it's always a good idea to click on the links as well. All right, to the article. A federal judge in New York on Monday ruled that, uh, that previously unreleased documents concerning dead pedophile Jeffrey Epstein would not be released as part of a defamation dispute involving Epstein's alleged Madam Ghislaine Maxwell and alleged victim Virginia Roberts. Now, we all knew that this was a possibility, right? We all knew that Maxwell's attorneys were working overtime to make sure that this didn't occur. And I'm guessing that it didn't fit the scope of what the judge saw as pertinent. Again, another judge who doesn't see things that should be released to the public as things that should be released to the public, right? Though the case ended in 2015, Roberts' attorneys have sought to unseal additional documents initially filed under seal, while Maxwell's legal team argued that documents do not fall under the definition of judicial documents and therefore are not subject to the presumption of access by the public. In an 11-page ruling, U.S. Dis District Judge Loretta A. Preska, who in August ordered the release of more than 2,000 previously sealed documents, found that the remaining documents were not judicial in nature and therefore not subject to the presumption of public access. And I believe that that can be argued, folks. This is not the end of the, the conversation by any means. Uh, you know how these lawyers work. The, the lawyers for Virginia Roberts will kick it into the next gear now, and they'll kick it up to the next, the next court, or they'll have it, have it before another judge, or they'll bring more evidence. This is certainly not the last word we've heard of this, but it still, it still sucks. I was hoping that these documents would be released and we'd get what I love, you know, what I love to always talk about we'd get a little bit more context added, right? And some more names. In order for a document to be considered judicial, it must be somehow relevant to the exercise of federal courts in determining actual controversies arrive, arising between adverse litigants. In this case, the underlying litigation between Miss Roberts and Miss Maxwell has long since settled, Presco wrote. Accordingly, all disputes regarding the underlying merits of the action have been rendered moot by the settlement. There is thus no live controversy to which the, ju the judicial power can extend. The vast majority of the documents in question were motions filed by Roberts that the trial court judge did not rule on before the case settled. With respect to motions left undecided by the trial judge, there was never, and now never can be, a judicial de a decision, making process that would trigger the public's right to access the undecided motions and the documents relevant to them. Preska wrote, but Preska also stressed that her ruling was narrow in scope, 
meaning it was tailored to the specific facts currently available and could be subject to change. And what that means, folks, is if more evidence comes forward and with the the fact that Ghislaine Maxwell is under investigation as we speak, if more evidence is presented, the court and Judge Preska could change her mind. The court is mindful of the of the fact that there is a great deal of pub, public intrigue surrounding the unsealing of the documents at issue here. With that in mind, the court emphasizes that this ruling is a narrow one, she wrote. And that's big. She's saying that it's by the slimmest of margins that these documents are saying sealed for now. And if the evidence is presented in the future, she is open to changing her mind and unsealing those documents. Notwithstanding the fact that the undecided motions and the papers associated with them are not judicial documents, they may eventually be unsealed because they are in some way relevant to the trial judge's actual decisions, which are numerous, that are certainly subject to the presumption of public access. And if you click on this link that will be in the description box, you'll be able to give it a read and it has the whole entire 11 page uh, ruling by the judge. So. Obviously, as I've stated several times, and as you all are uh, pretty aware, I'm certainly not a lawyer, folks, right? But this does leave the door open for this to move forward. Now, they'll have to provide more evidence to the court and specifically to Judge Preska, but she has not made up her mind, and by the, it's only by the slimmest of margins that these, uh, these files are staying sealed as of now. And that's the way I'm interpreting it anyway. I, I, like I said, I'm not a lawyer, obviously. To me, that's what it looks like. It looks like she hasn't truly made up her mind. And the only reason that she's keeping them sealed at this point is because the law, is, the law states that she must do so. And if they, brought, they, if they bring more evidence here, well, I think that she'll definitely change her mind and we could see a, a, a different outcome in um, some sort of a appeal to this ruling. All right, our next article is about Nicholas Tartaglioni, and this article is from the Daily News. It's by John Anise, and it was published on January 13th, 2020, at 1119 p.m. Lawyer for Jeffrey Epstein's cellmate wants hearing on why video of first suicide attempt was destroyed. Yeah, it's probably a good idea. I don't think it's a bad idea for there to be a hearing about that. But again, what are the investigators going to investigate the investigators? I mean, it's a joke. We need some... I I know I'm beating a dead horse here, folks. We need some sort of commission. The lawyer for Jeffrey Epstein's former cellmate wants to know who screwed up when video of the billionaire perv's first suicide attempt was destroyed and how the snafu happened. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty much what everybody wants to know. Who was in charge of the chain of custody of the evidence? Who was in charge of the evidence? Who was in charge of the person who was in charge of the evidence? Where was the guard, the supervisor on duty when all of this was occurring? Nobody checked on their employees for eight hours? I don't know about you folks, but if, you, if you've ever been a supervisor or a boss, you know you can't give your employees more than 30 or 40 minutes on the front line without checking on them to make sure they're doing the right thing. I'm sure it's the same here, right? I'm sure if these, these guards have access to the internet and they're hanging around and they think everything's just going to be just fine with Jeffrey Epstein, well, they should probably be checked on every once in a while, don't you think? Bruce Barkett, lawyer for quadruple murder suspect Nicholas Tartaglioni, is calling for a hearing to get to the bottom of the mind-boggling drama surrounding the footage, including whether anyone acted in bad faith on the federal government's part. You think whether anyone acted in bad faith, huh? You think this was an accident? You think it was an accident that the wrong tier was being videotaped? You really think that was an accident? You think all of this stuff leading up to Jeffrey Epstein's death was just coincidence? It was just, just circumstance. It just happened to happen. You know, that's it. That's what they want you to, to, to believe. They want you to believe that it was just all coincidence. And the problem was, well, the problem was the guards had to work overtime. So they were extra tired. So they weren't able to perform their duties. That's what they want you to believe. When in reality, we've all seen the big picture now. We've had the curtain pulled back. We have stared directly into the room and we have seen the deviousness. All right, so they can't put that back in the box now. That pan, the pan, Pandora's box is opened, and the things that have escaped can never be put back in. 
At first, U.S. Attorney Jason Swergold said the footage hadn't been preserved. Twenty preserved. Twenty-four hours later, he reversed himself and said the video had been archived. Last week, however, prosecutors said MCC staff preserved footage from outside the wrong cell and that the footage was destroyed after all, declaring the video no longer exists on the prison's backup system because of technical errors, prosecutors wrote. Technical errors. Were there technical errors with any of the other prisoners on the, on the line? No, just Jeffrey Epstein, huh? It just so happened that only the cameras that were supposed to be trained on Jeffrey Epstein and on his cell were the ones that malfunctioned. It o- it's only Jeffrey Epstein's evidence that disappears. I wonder why, folks. I wonder why. Do you think it was because he was a great guy and everybody just loved having him around? He was just such a swell fella. Everybody just wanted to hang out with good old Jeffy Eppy. Or was it that he was greasing everybody's pants and he was making sure that he had his tentacles wrapped around everybody that you could possibly imagine in a place of power? That's how this man rolled. Aside from mentioning MCC staff, the government has not provided the name of a single individual responsible for the loss of the video, Barkett wrote on Monday's court filing. Yeah, I've been saying that for how long? You got these two guards, uh, the, the two prison guards that were responsible for minding Epstein and checking on them. We know everything about them. We got their names, where they live, etc., etc. But the people that were in charge of the chain of custody of the video? Nah, we don't know anything about them. That's just staff. Just staff? Really? What are you the... Oh, man, it makes me so mad. This makes me this makes me so aggravated, folks. So aggravated that they could be this inept. And if it's not ineptitude, right? If it's not ineptitude, then what is it? Straight up malfeasance? Tartaglioni, a former Briarcliff Manor cop, is accused of murdering four men in an Orange County bar over a Mexican cartel-linked drug deal gone bad and burying their bodies on his sprawling animal rescue farm. Well, kudos for the animal rescue stuff. I'll give you some props for that. But the rest of your life, you seem to be like a pretty despicable human being, sir. He could face the death penalty if he's convicted of the murders, and Barkett hopes the video will show he acted admirably by alerting the correction officers in time to save Epstein's life after the failed first suicide bid. Oh yeah, I'm sure this guy is a pillar of the community, folks. He was so worried about Jeffrey Epstein living that he contacted the guards. You know he stood up and was yelling, Hey, Epstein's hurt here, folks. Whoa, somebody come and help him. Stop it. All right? We all understand what occurred. This dude assaulted Jeffrey Epstein, all right? That's what Epstein said. Epstein said that he was assaulted. He didn't say he tried to commit suicide. And then he was put on suicide watch by the Keystone cops here at the MCC. And somehow, he still ends up dead. We're not looking to point fingers at anybody. We'd like to have a record of what took place with the video, Barkett told the Daily News Monday night. We want to be able to show that incarcerated... He's still acting appropriately and doing the right thing, as in Nicholas Tartaglioni. Epstein hanged himself in a different cell at the troubled jail August 10th, which he occupied alone, officials said. Barkett said he wants to know who the Federal Bureau of Prisons lawyer, Adam Johnson, spoke to when he advised prison staff to preserve the video and what was done in response. These are great questions. These are great questions from Mr. Barkett. Even though I believe his client is a scumbag, I think Mr. Barkett is on the right track here and he's asking the right questions. He listed the the string of questions he hopes to ask at the hearing, including who actually viewed the footage prior to its destruction, Are there protocols in place at MCC with respect to evidence preservation? Were the digital records ever actually checked for accuracy? Who was the MCC staff member who initially confirmed that the video had been preserved? All fantastic questions. All very good questions that all need answers. Do you think we'll get those answers, folks? Do you think the federal government will be forthcoming? Do you think Mr. Barr is going to be forthcoming? Or are we going to get some more yap about how he's seen the footage and we should believe him because he's telling us that nothing happened? What? No, I don't believe you. I don't believe any of them. I don't believe any elected elected official at this point. I don't believe any bureaucrat who has been appointed by elected officials. And I certainly do not believe 
anything that Nicholas Tartaglioni's talking about. This dude's a, a rogue cop who's on the hook for bodying four dudes in a drug deal gone bad. And this is the guy that we're relying on for evidence? You know what George R.R. R. Martin would call someone like that, folks? George R.R. R. Martin would call that an unreliable narrator. And that is what Nicholas Tartaglioni is, an unreliable narrator. Really, though, the real problem is, and the elephant in the room is, why in the, the, why in the world, okay, in the first place, was Jeffrey Epstein even in a cell with that big guy? That big, roided-out monster of a man who was charged with four murders. You don't put Jeffrey Epstein in with some sort of, you know, uh, some embezzler or some computer criminal, and you send that computer criminal or embezzler in there or white-collar crime person in there with the intent to try and work Epstein for information. Instead, you put him in with a guy facing four bodies? Why would you do that? Unless, of course... It would just be convenient for your problem to go away by Nicholas Tartaglioni taking care of it. Now, I'm not saying that that's, you know, that Tartaglioni was definitely going to do that, but the optics do not look good, folks, right? Why would you put Epstein in this jail cell with a guy like Tartaglioni? This is a man that obviously has no problem with violence, charged with four murders and a drug deal gone bad, and if he was willing to murder four people, I'm pretty sure that it was not his first time, okay? Now you have him in jail, and who's to say who's reached out to him? Who's to say who he knows? So why would the prison, the jail, think it's a good idea for him to share a cell with Jeffrey Epstein? Nobody can answer that question for me either. Why wouldn't you have Epstein in with a, with a guy like the, the Mursky guy that we, that we talked about a few weeks back? The guy that was basically Epstein's quote-unquote companion, the old fella. Why wouldn't you have that guy as, as Epstein's cellmate? And he's a known conf, uh, confidential informant as well. You have him work Epstein for information. Instead, you put him in with this Tartaglioni guy, and you know that Epstein was shitting his pants, right? This is a guy that comes from high crust. He's never had a, a big grease monkey like this ready to choke him out. A big Ginzaloon dude like this, right? There ain't no way in hell he's ever been in a jail cell, a small confined area where he can't get away with a monster like Tartaglioni. That's a big, that's a big dude, folks. And... And willing to go to that length of violence of killing four people in a drug deal gone bad? I'm guessing Jeffrey Epstein was none too plussed about being in there with him. And is it too far of a stretch of the imagination to believe that Tartaglioni assaulted Jeffrey Epstein in that prison cell? He knows he's looking at life, uh, Tartaglioni, possibly the death sentence. So if he assaults this child molester, he gets some credibility when he goes and hits the main line, right? When he hits the yard. He might be an ex-cop, but he was a dirty ex-cop. And now, he not only is he a dirty ex-cop and he has some street credibility that way well he busted up this chomo right hey i busted up jeffrey epstein what up so you know prison's a whole different place folks and the rules are different the politics are different everything is different so if you think tartaglioni is above assaulting epstein this first time around i got news for you he is not all right folks i'll be back tomorrow morning with the usual Day, uh, morning update, daily drop, and we might even do another evolution episode tomorrow afternoon. I want to do a couple more leading up to Santa Fe, a few more on Santa Fe. That way we have as much context as possible heading into the trip. It is coming up real quick, folks, and I cannot wait to be there. Make sure if you're not subscribed as a, a subscriber on Spreaker, our platform, our podcast hosting site, make sure you, subs uh, you subscribe there so that when I'm in New Mexico, you don't miss out on the live feeds as well, because I'm going to be doing some of them as well. All right, everybody, I hope you have an amazing night, and I will talk to you tomorrow. If you'd like to contact me, you can do that at bobbycapucci at protonmail.com. That's B-O-B-B-Y-C-A-P-U-C-C-I at protonmail.com. And if you would like to help support the podcast, you can do that by clicking on the GoFundMe link in the description box.